Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for joining this session focused on pandemic recovery and resilience. My name is Jan Bird and I'm the Director of Health Policy at Healthcare Excellence Canada. I live and work in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'm joined by Ronan Seagrave today. Over the next 20 minutes, I'll give an overview of this important focus area for HEC. We'll hear from Ronan about our work together and we'll ask you for your input into what meaningful improvement in this focus area would look like. As we get set to introduce the work, I wish to take a moment to acknowledge the tremendous impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's had an impact on each one of us, personally, professionally, in almost every aspect of our lives. Those of us working in the healthcare system have likely never experienced such a wide scale and long-term challenge before. And so it is with some hope and optimism today that we are pleased to share the results of many months of work that HEC will use to guide programming to support pandemic recovery and resilience. We acknowledge that this pandemic related work may never see a total recovery, but rather we are aiming to support operational changes and policy reforms that will provide ongoing resilience and strength within our healthcare systems. Like much of the work we do here at HEC, over the past many months, we have been listening deeply to the voices of those experiencing the pandemic. And we are now finalizing a what we heard document. A series of interviews and group discussions were held with health system leaders, key decision makers and policymakers, and expert representatives, including patient and family and caregiver partners from across the country. And these have been distilled, additionally supported by relevant data and reports as they emerge. Altogether, nine priority theme areas were identified, reinforced, and validated. These are rooted in common challenges faced during the past 19 months. The link between them and the reason HEC has prioritized them in this manner is that while each of them has revealed or exacerbated deep systemic problems, they are also domains in which change is possible to allow for greater health system cohesion and the resilience that we would all so like to see. HEC is at the nexus of policy and practice in our thinking and in our approaches to supporting health system improvement. The content from the What We Heard document is now being organized into a self-assessment and toolkit format. The toolkit discusses the context of each of these nine theme areas and is de designed to offer a range of innovative and evidence-based options for action for policymakers, health system leaders, and planners at various levels in the healthcare system across Canada so that they can find a place to start and focus their efforts on work that will make a meaningful improvement. So you've got the nine theme areas on, the, on your slide. I'll talk about the first four first. In some ways, these first four are different dimensions of the same overall operational challenge during the pandemic, that of balancing available resource supply against a dynamically shifting set of demands. All Canadian health systems are still finding pandemic equilibrium to balance the needs of the pre-March 2020 health system with the needs of pandemic response and beyond. The remaining five challenges we have grouped as policy and sectoral issues each one was a known system challenge pre-March 2020 that was highlighted dramatically by the COVID-19 pandemic and our system response to it. Most of the five areas required significant attention and intervention during wave one and or wave two. All interviewees call for a major policy refresh post-pandemic in each of these five areas. If these examples have intrigued you, we are glad to see that you too share a spark of optimism for working towards a resilient health system. At HEC, we share a passion for innovative improvement and catalyzing policy change. And as with any improvement journey, it begins with one step. I'm now pleased to introduce you to Ronan Seagrave, who will speak to you a bit more about the theme areas, priorities for action, and what you can find in the toolkit. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jan, for that excellent uh, overview. I too am in Winnipeg uh, today, which is Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very honoured to be speaking at this wonderful event, the launch of Health Excellence Canada. 
Uh, as Jan referred to, I'm delighted to be working with HS HEC to develop what we're calling the COVID-19 Recovery and Resilience Toolkit. For 16 months, I lived in your shoes, running Health Sciences Centre in Winnipeg, a large provincial and tertiary hospital, and supporting Manitoba Incident Command. The challenges that we have faced collectively together have been unprecedented in our lifetimes. They have involved both a combination of speed and difficulty of decision-making none of us could have comprehended prior to January 2020. I want to thank each of you for everything you did and everything you were doing to support patients and staff under the most stressful of circumstances. Like Jan, I too feel that spark of optimism. There is much we have learned throughout the course of the pandemic and the, and, and the, and the various waves. While acknowledging that the pandemic brought into sharp focus and amplified pre-existing system challenges, both operational and where policy needs to shift. Where I do have some pessimism, though, is that international epidemiological experts have identified the threat of a further, perhaps more deadly, global pandemic within our lifetimes as high. None of us should assume that the COVID-19 pandemic is a one-off event in our lives. The changes, therefore, that we make over the next one to three years are therefore crucial in both ensuring a successful recovery from COVID-19 as it shifts to an endemic disease, but also in strengthening the resilience of our health systems across Canada, which will bring significant improvements in the quality of care for patients and ensure that we are much better prepared to respond to a future pandemic. The nine priority areas that Jan outlined may seem at this point in the midst, as many of you are grappling with the fourth wave, challenging and perhaps even daunting. The approach we are taking in HEC is very pragmatic in developing the toolkit. We are examining each of the nine priority theme areas and drawing out what we think are the key high impact changes, the key areas to focus on that we think will help system leaders and policymakers in navigating the next challenging few years. To take a few practical examples of the high impact changes we're working on, let's look at, at human health resources. Areas we're focusing on clearly involve improving and maintaining health and well-being of our staff, in particular the need for staff to take flexible annual leave. And that will require much more robust ag agile rostering and scheduling than perhaps we have been doing up to now. We need to enable and maintain upskilling and top of line, top of license and scope of practice incentives for all our staff. This should mean the current health care human resources do not revert to pre-pandemic working and where career paths are clearly articulated. We need to expand and make permanent new care delivery models. Examples include use of hospitals banking and pooling HHR to enable plan sharing of limited resources equitably across multiple sites and team-based models of care that tremendous innovation that happened throughout the course of the pandemic must now become effectively permanent. In looking at the backlog of services, examples could include creating elective surgery, surgery hubs, often referred to as cold or green sites that specifically focus on planned care only, for example, no emergency department attached including transformation of day case and inpatient and outpatient care pathways and activity delivery. Looking at surgery prioritization, focusing on those specialities with the longest waits and balanced with critica criticality and acuity. For example, patients that need to be seen within 24 hours, 48 hours, one month, three months, et cetera. We need a prioritization approach, which is deemed fair, equitable and inclusive. Challenges, for example, you may be grappling with right now is should all one or two year wait plus weights be, back, be tackled first? In relation to diagnostics and the backlog there, looking at new innovative models such as creating offsite diagnostic hubs, providing a range of services, particularly MRI and CT scans plus ultrasound, X-ray and mammography, physiological measurement equipment and pathology looking at other models in other jurisdictions that effectively provide a one-stop shop and don't incur a bottleneck in relation to access and waiting times. Looking at policy and, and where we think policy needs to shift and looking at the care of older people, I think it's probably obvious to all of us that we need to transition from a long-term care bed dependency and crisis-driven model to a model 
that promotes independence, choice, control, dignity and respect for older people. Tapping into community connectivity and, and, and an approach that is whole person holistic care. Our policy approach ought to be supporting older people to live as independently and as well as possible in their own homes. And we also need to recognize the interdependency between caring for vulnerable and at-risk communities and those downstream impacts, for example, on emergency department admissions, hospital admissions, ALC and long-term uh, complex care packages. These are just a few examples of some of the high impact areas that we're looking at and working on. And we're looking at developing because we want this to be really pragmatic and helpful, developing what we call playbooks for each of the high impact areas, which will include a diagnostic component. Uh, because I recognize that every province and territory health system is in a different place. You already have initiatives underway. Our approach is to provide a framework that is supportive and helpful to you as much as possible. We are looking to launch the toolkit uh, later this fall. And both Jan and I view the toolkit as a living framework added to over time by you with the great work that you have underway or that you're embarking on. Thank you for listening to me today. And back to you, Jan, thank you. Thanks, Ronan. So now we would like to get your input through the Zoom chat feature. Tell us, does this resonate? What are you thinking about? And what would meaningful improvement in this area of pandemic recovery and resilience look like? You can just take a moment and type into the chat um, your thoughts. We'll welcome any feedback from you. This work is under development. And as I said, we've been listening deeply through our stakeholder consultations and to, to you from across the country. Where is the best space for HEC to be leading and partnering? What are those policy spaces that you see us in or even programming? Hi, Pam from the UK. So good to see you here. Enhanced mental health support. Absolutely, critically important. We know that children and youth and adults from every different background have been impacted with mental health issues and of course staff. I think it's well understood that um, healthcare providers and leaders are really experiencing high levels of mental distress, moral distress and serious mental health issues. Very much like the idea of having a part of the hospital that is earmarked for elective cases only. Rona, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Having a part of the hospital that is earmarked for elective cases only to avoid this backlog. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, looking at such a leading practice in relation to elective surgery, it's quite possible to create, for want of a better word, an elective surgery shop. You know, the patient arrives at a separate part of your hospital or a standalone building, for example, I was looking at a specific building at Health Science Centre in Winnipeg that is purely for elective surgery. It can be just purely day. Um, if you have beds available, it can be, you know, one, two, two overnight stays um, as possible uh, as, as a maximum. And what those models do and have, have demonstrated in other jurisdictions is improvements in efficiency and productivity. Um, start, the patient is going there, having the procedure, uh, I also think this is important on the HHR front. Um, the more that we can provide um, stability, at least for a portion of our surgical staff, uh, at this time, the better. And, and I did find in, in Health Sciences Centre a lot of enthusiasm for this. Um, issues for staff were often, particularly those juggling young children and, and, and all of the complexities the pandemic has brought with that, that having that sort of stability knowing that you were doing relatively routine procedures and that your shift is from a certain hours as opposed to you could be on a, a on an OR rota where you're dealing with sort of more urgent cases uh, in terms of where the time in, in OR may be more highly variable. Um, so I, 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 there is merit in this, I believe. Um, I believe it, it, evidence from other jurisdictions demonstrates improvement and efficiency and productivity. And I believe it provides HHR benefits in terms of providing 
greater stability in relation and, and, and more consistency uh, for staff in terms of the shifts that are working. Thank you. Lots of great comments coming in. So many recognizing the impact on the mental health and well-being of everyone. And so looking at what are those long-term strategies. Um, I see policy reform, I see programming, I see us partnering with our pan-Canadian health organizations that have a real focus in that space. And so absolutely agree. And um, long COVID was mentioned. I mean, we don't even know all of the effects, but we're seeing lots of things happening. And this is in fact, a new cohort of patients that we may need to plan for and building it as we go. Someone mentioned primary care, and that is so important. You know, one of those nine theme areas is that we look at how do we better integrate? What we saw was silos, public health was here, primary care was there, acute care was here, long-term care was there. We can't go back to that. And so what does integration look like? This is a chance to reimagine that in a good way <clears throat> that makes sense and, and doesn't burden one particular silo or piece. And thank you for the comment about the workers. Absolutely. People in the workforce are such an important focus area for us at HEC. And so always, always we'll be working with those who provide care and having them enable and help us to shape the future in programming, in policy, and by deeply listening. Ronan, do you want to speak to the, anything about the models of care mentioned here, or what we may be thinking about? Yes, absolutely. I, I, Jan and I have talked in the past that uh, we're getting into our actual ages, uh, but um, we are from a cohort of a generation that I think, in terms of looking at long-term care, our expectations are, are, are very, very different. Jan and I have also looked at, at sort of international data and, and our rates of uh, institutionalizing older people are, are, are significantly higher than other jurisdictions. Um, we do need to shift in terms of how we deliver care here, in terms of, first of all, from a policy perspective, our objective is around older people living as, and indeed other vulnerable adults, living as independently as possible in their own homes. If you take that as your sort of starting point, your overarching policy objective, you're working back from that in relation to looking at, at, at care models. And care models can come at various different parts in the pathway. One uh, is around sort of increased rapid response services in terms of where, for example, an older person falls in their home, um, is a team able to go in there? Perhaps um, the fall is not that serious in terms of hospitalization is not required. The person is able, being able to stabilize at home and there's the agility to uh, deliver a very focused uh, time limited care package uh, to, help that, to help that older person. Dan, I've talked about reablement, uh, a, a model of home care, which is around not dependency based in terms of you know, care workers coming in, doing all of the sort of uh, activities of, of daily living tasks, such as dressing and bathing, but actually helping the patient. If there is some level of permanent impairment, reable that, that individual to do those tasks for themselves. And we've seen examples in other jurisdictions where that has significantly reduced uh, the need for ongoing care. We need to use technology uh, to support that. We, and many of us do ourselves. You can put devices, sensors, we've got something called the Internet of Things uh, in people's houses. They help manage risk in terms of, you know, the cooker's being left on, the alert goes off, the toilet hasn't been flushed. This is all within our, our power to do. But I believe most importantly, the shift, when I was in consultant, uh, you know, I, I attended some meetings where we're planning, I'm just being very honest here, and planning around care for older people was how many PCH beds we need. That needs to shift. It needs, it needs to shift to a strategy, a policy that is about providing and allowing people to live as independently as possible in our own homes. And what are the things we can do in terms of different care models right across the pathway? becoming much more targeted and focused about prevention in terms of looking at those risk factors that drive hospitalization and that drive admissions into PCH. So I think this is quite exciting in terms of, uh, in terms of us doing this shift, but I also believe it's absolutely necessary. Thank you, Jan. Thanks. Lots of great comments coming in, Ronan. We're so lucky to be engaging in this dialogue and thank you for the comments. I'll, I'll say that one of the things I really love about working at HEC is that we really do take a whole of system approach. 
So we work closely with FPT governments. We have um, deputy ministers and, and associate deputy ministers come to the table and work with us. And so we work with system leaders, we work with planners, we work with government, we work with patients, families, caregivers, and partners. And so you're right, this is, this is a new way of thinking. This requires a shift in um, how we set policy, what the measures are for accountability or for what success looks like, and that will take time. But we've got the people coming to the table to listen, and that's what I think is really, really important and foundational as we slowly try and, and change how we look at caring for older adults, for example, and what safe care looks like in the community and who provides that. You know, we've talked about who supports a mental health crisis in the community. How do we um, best use folks to their scope of practice, maybe thinking outside the box? And so please keep in touch with us and keep the comments coming today, but even after today, so that we can hear from you what your ideas are, what you've seen work. Maybe there's a spark of innovation that we can support to grow. And then we can also look at what policies are needed to really keep things, you know, when something is enshrined in policy, whatever that looks like, um, regulations, legislation, and operational policy at work, um, they tend to stick better. So we're really looking at uh, working with the whole system. Ronan, do you see any comment you'd like to respond to? Yeah, somebody rose uh, digital, and 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 yes, we are, we are looking at that, and in in and also specifically in relation to virtual care. We we all know what happened in, generally in Canada around the Big Bang switch over once the pandemic started. But I just wanted to make a couple of comments on, on this. One, um, healthcare, like every other industry, should just start looking at this as a part of healthcare. It is not something separate or a bolt on. You know, over here we're doing inpatient care, over here we're doing virtual care. Again, that minds, in my view, that mindset shift needs to needs to start now. That it is how we deliver care. And I actually think a lot of the hard work on virtual care is yet to come. And if to truly achieve that, we there's obviously work we need to do around redesigning pathways uh, from a perspective of virtual and digital enablement. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, interest across Canada, particularly looking at things because of the impact of the pandemic and, and latent demand, looking at things like virtual EDs and virtual critical care. But again, if we come from a mindset and it is part of healthcare, not something separate, um, we'll get to the answers. And I, I talked to one person last week who said, well, we can't do virtual care rolling because we need extra staff. <laughs> we don't. Um, if, if you come from a, a position of where it is just part of healthcare, and I think that's the next great leap. We had the big bang in relation to virtual care, but when we actually think about it, doing outpatient visits via video channel is probably not that radical or transformational in itself. Where the real transformation comes is looking across pathways, taking a whole system perspective in relation to virtual and digital and understanding it is now part of healthcare, uh, not something separate, not a bolt on. And yes, there are lots of issues that need to be worked through around patient acceptance, or privacy, security, uh, and also ensuring that, that perhaps tariffs become permanent here. But I believe it is absolutely core in, in, in relation to, to healthcare going forward. And if we get it right, it will help us with other challenges and, and support other challenges that we have, particularly in relation to, uh, to human resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today in discussion. We know that the healthcare system is, is stressed, beyond stressed. The people leading it have been there so long at the front lines in leadership positions and support positions. And this pandemic has exposed so many weaknesses. I think even when we started our writing several five or so months ago, we thought we'd be in a different position than we are today and we're not. So I hope that the work that we will show you soon will have practical short-term, medium-term and longer-term approaches that you can take. We'll work together um, with you, the educators, the policy makers, health system leaders, healthcare providers, patients, families, caregiver partners, to move ahead in a meaningful way. So I wanna just talk about some ways that you can engage with us, just recognizing we're coming to the end of our time. 
I want to thank all of you for being here again. Thank you to Ronan Seagrave for joining us today. It's just a delight to work with you. And thanks for being with us as we launched our inaugural strategy at Healthcare Excellence Canada. We want to shape a future where everyone in Canada has safe and high quality healthcare. This is an ambitious purpose and our focus area is pretty intense pandemic recovery and resilience. But we are so focused and we are tackling some pressing challenges while facing this ongoing pandemic. And it seems like these, these focus areas are resonating with you. And for that and your feedback, I am so thankful. On the slide, you can see some ways of staying engaged. Please visit our website where you can find our strategy and current opportunities. Join in the conversation and participate in Canadian Patient Safety Week, October 5th to 20, 25th to 29th. If you're interested or want to be a tester or keep in touch about the toolkit, please do reach out. We look forward to working with partners like all of you across the country to realize our shared purpose. Thank you so much. Merci. This concludes today's event.